One of the greatest obstacles to crafting health and wellness is identifying and controlling inflammation. It's at the core of all complex and chronic diseases, and it's the driving mechanism that underlies the most common symptoms that people like you struggle to overcome. Join us as we explore cutting-edge science and research to give you the information and tools you need to create the quality of life you want and deserve. And now, here is the host of Inflammation Nation, Dr. Stephen Noseworthy. Hey there, I'm Dr. Steve Noseworthy, and this is the Inflammation Nation podcast. This week, we're talking about cortisol and the impact on leaky gut. And I have to be careful because if I'm not, if I'm not paying attention to the things that I'm sharing with you today, this is going to turn into uh, an episode or a series of episodes on leaky gut. So let me just state from the out, from the get-go that uh, more than likely, once we're done with the hormone series, we'll, we'll probably launch into a discussion, a broader and a deeper discussion on leaky gut for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, intestinal permeability and the consequences of having that uh, has profound and far-reaching effects on human metabolism, particularly if you have something that challenges you that lies in the realm of some kind of inflammatory disorder, including autoimmune disease. Um, the other aspect of this is that leaky gut is a hot topic. Um, it's been around for a while. We've known about it in medical research for a while. When, you know, the group that I, I tour and lecture with, uh, we've been teaching on this for uh, 12 or 13 years. I think the first lecture I did on leaky gut was maybe 2009, 2010. And, and I believe my group was one of the first, if not the first, that brought the research on leaky gut into the realm of functional medicine seminars, and we started teaching docs what it is and, and how we can deal with it. Um, so there I go down my bunny trail. Um, so let, let's kind of back up, and, and I'll, I'm going to give you a maybe a one-minute review of what leaky gut is, just so that if, if you by chance you're listening to this and maybe you've heard of leaky gut, but you don't really have a good mental picture of what it is, let me just give you the highlights and if you're interested, then you know we'll do a, a little series on this and, and talk about it in broader context. But basically think of this. The lining of your intestinal system, actually, let me back up one step. There's only a couple of ways that things can get inside us to, to um, say, poison us in the, in the sense of a toxin or infect us in the sense of some kind of a microbe. And that is it can cross our skin. We can absorb it. Um, we can breathe it in or we can swallow it or we can have a cut in the skin for example and, and so there is what we call the barrier system the lining of the gut is part of your barrier system which is a bigger concept and umbrella term but basically barriers function to separate different environments and so my skin is a barrier so that things from the outside don't get inside but again I breathe in and I swallow things and so we want some kind of sophisticated filtration capacity in the, in the cells that line my respiratory system and the cells that line my intestines so that the things I breathe in and swallow don't get inside me to infect me or cause some kind of a toxic reaction. But because the truth is, is that every bite of food you, you eat and every liquid that you swallow um, most of the air that we breathe is full of things that want to get inside us and infect us or cause some kind of a toxin response. That's just the reality of the world that we live in. And so thankfully, by design, we have this barrier system that works in our favor. And what it does is it, is it selectively filters out certain things and allows certain things to pass into the bloodstream, things that we want, like nutrients from our diet, for example. And it excludes other things like toxins or viruses or bacteria or heavy metals and chemicals, it excludes those from being absorbed into the bloodstream so that we can bind them and neutralize them and get rid of them so that they don't get inside our internal environment. And that's really what the function of the gut barrier is. And what that means is that when we have leaky gut or we have an increase in intestinal permeability, more things pass into the bloodstream than are supposed to. And the short answer is, the net result is a local as well as a systemic inflammatory response. Because with a leaky gut, not only do we get inflammation in the local gut tissue that affects the gut environment and how that functions, but the inflammatory chemicals will escape into general circulation where they have a tendency to flare up problems that you already have. So, you know, one of the key questions that people 
often ask, and that this includes doctors, of what are what are the key symptoms of leaky gut? And you know, the true answer is that there are no hallmark symptoms. There are some things that we tend to look for as an indicator that somebody might have a leaky gut, but there's no definitive set of symptoms or no single symptom for sure that says, hey, you've got a leaky gut and you need to fix it. And this is where definitive testing or objective testing comes in because I would much rather know someone does or does not have a leaky gut um, rather than just guess they do or they don't. And as a general rule, I like to err on the side of caution. So if I'm forced into a situation where I have to make an educated guess, I'm going to assume that somebody has it rather than not because I'd rather, I'd rather treat you as if you do and be wrong rather than treat you as if you don't and be wrong. And that's just one of the ways that I try to protect the interest of, of the one-on-one -on -one clients that I work with. All right, I'm rambling and in danger of going off into a, a series on leaky gut. So let me, let me pause there and just give you a mental image and then we'll talk about cortisol and, and the role of cortisol. So imagine that you have, you know, let's say you're in your kitchen and you need to strain out some rice. If you have a fine mesh strainer in your kitchen, you'll dump the rice and the water into the fine mesh strainer and all the rice will stay inside that strainer and all the water and all the starchy dissolved stuff is going to go through the holes. And, and this is the point of fine mesh strainer. It's to have a whole bunch of little teeny tiny holes that basically allows only water and very little else to go through. So pretty much whatever you're straining stays inside the strainer. And that's the way a normal gut barrier is supposed to function. Only certain things get through, things that are to our advantage. But imagine now that you have instead of, you know, you still need to strain your rice, but you don't have a fine mesh strainer, but you have a colander that you normally use to strain vegetables. And these, you know, there's big holes and slots in a colander. And so surprise, surprise, you dump the rice and the water into the colander and most of the rice falls through the holes with the water. And that's not what you were looking for. And in essence, that's what intestinal permeability is, is it's an increase in the spaces in between the cells of the, the cells that line the gut so that things can pass through that are supposed to be excluded from passing through. And then they get into the bloodstream and along the way they activate immunological responses driving both local and systemic inflammation. That's probably about as simple and as short as I can describe leaky gut. Because to be honest, that you know, at this point there are, the last time I checked, which was about six months ago, there were just shy of 20,000 research articles that had something to do with intestinal permeability in our in PubMed or the the National Library of Medicine, and, and that's a lot. And there's a lot of interest in this, just simply because all of the early research pointed to leaky gut as being a key component of chronic inflammatory disorders, including things like autoimmune diseases. All right, we'll just leave it there for the moment. So let's talk about cortisol. What's the impact? So the relationship here is is quite interesting. We we have kind of a historical understanding that stress can cause ulcers, gastric ulcers. And in reality, if, if you think about it, a gastric ulcer is a macroscopic, a big example of leaky gut. Or to say it the other way, leaky gut is a microscopic example of a gastric ulcer. With a gastric ulcer, you, if you stick a, a camera down someone's intestines and take a look at their stomach or their small intestine, if there's an ulcer there, you can see it. It's a big hole. It's an erosion in the tissue. It's typically red and it's inflamed, but it's kind of like a, a scalloped out piece. You can actually visualize it, not with your naked eye, but through the camera. But you can't visualize intestinal permeability because it's all microscopic. You literally would have to look under a microscope rather, rather than using a camera that's used, for example, in some kind of an endoscopy procedure. And so we've known this relationship between stress and gastric ulceration, and really all we have to do is go, okay, well, maybe it takes a certain amount of chronic stress and cortisol production for the lining of the gut to break down that you can see it on a camera. How much then does it take for a microscopic problem to become an issue, even though it still stays microscopic and we can't see a frank ulcer? And hopefully you're following with what I'm saying here. So my point is this, is that we've known for decades and decades that there's a relationship between stress chemistry and ulceration of gastric tissue. Gastric ulcers represent the extreme of that relationship, 
but there are changes in the permeability of the intestinal system based on less stress or smaller increases in cortisol. Now, now that we understand that there's, there's this relationship that really high cortisol can cause these macroscopic ulcers to happen, high cortisol can increase intestinal permeability. I'll get back to that just in a second. The interesting thing here is that the opposite is also true, is that you actually need some cortisol to initiate the repair process. And, and so because the lining of your intestinal system is, li or, or is made up of living cells, these cells are being damaged and broken down and repaired and replaced on an ongoing basis. This is happening all the time. So we have to have some kind of a biochemical repair process that involves um, activation of a controlled immune response within that tissue. Of course, the immune system, uh, including inflammation, is required to repair any tissue. If I break a leg, for example, or if I get a cut in my skin, I want my immune system to activate. I want my immune system to create an inflammatory response, but a controlled one, because that's how I repair tissues. In fact, I am right now about seven and a half weeks post shoulder surgery. And yeah, there is an inflammatory response. And, and I'll tell you, <laughs> despite my doctor and my physical therapist's um, recommendations, I didn't use any anti-inflammatories. I didn't even use ice in my uh, immediate period after surgery, not even to control swelling, because I don't want to dampen the inflammatory immune response that's involved in normal natural healing. That's a strategy that well, it, that's another bunny trail, so let, let me go off. If you, if you want uh, some more details on that, just pop me an email at podcast at drknowsworthy.com and say, hey, what about inflammation and not using ice after surgery? Just pop me a line and I'll, I'll try to answer that for you. Hi there, it's Dr. Noseworthy. I want to extend my appreciation to all of you in the Inflammation Nation who have helped my podcast become a great success in these first few months. I truly appreciate you. Also wanted to let you know about my brand new do-it-yourself online program called the Five-Step Gut Protocol. I designed this program for people who want to take charge of their own health and stop waiting around for someone else to tell them what to do. I've combined old naturopathic principles with cutting edge research to create a truly unique program that will help you construct your own gut protocol. If you've ever wondered if you have gut infections, a leaky gut, or a bad microbiome, then this program will walk you through the steps to figure that out and gives you the tools that you need to formulate a practical strategy to help make things better. I guarantee at the end of this course, you'll know more about your gut than your doctor does, and you will feel confident that you know how to address your unique situation. You can check it out at my website at www.drnoseworthy.com. That's D R noseworthy.com and just look for the tab at the top that says the programs. Thanks for listening. Um, yeah, I told you it was going to be dangerous and, and difficult not to get sidetracked on this discussion. And, and really it's for two reasons. Number one, because cortisol is part of your survival mechanism linked into everything else. But the regulation of the gut environment and the integrity of this this gut barrier is so important to health and wellness that it's difficult not to get sidetracked on one point and end up five episodes down the road and we haven't even talked about cortisol yet. So let me back up. There is a kind of a U-shaped response with cortisol and its relationship to intestinal permeability. Too much cortisol can break down the gut barrier, increasing permeability, and too little cortisol prevents you from repairing the gut. So let's start with that last one. Well, the way that cortisol is in, involved in um, initiating gut repair is because there's a relationship between cortisol and the activation of um, what's called prostaglandin 2, which technically is a pro-inflammatory prostaglandin. And normally if we think or talk about pro-inflammatory prostaglandins that are you know, part of the omega-6 metabolism pathway, we tend to think of them as being negative players in our inflammatory cascade, and we want to try to limit it. But, you know, just like everything, inflammation is good as long as it's intentional and as long as it is well controlled. We want inflammation when we repair tissues and on and on and on. And so cortisol is involved in the activation of prostaglandin 2, which is then involved in the biochemical repair of 
the intestinal lining, what's called the epithelial system. So we need a little bit of cortisol, or let's say sufficient cortisol, to initiate the repair process. But on the other side, as we've already talked about, too much cortisol in the extreme can cause frank ulceration. But increases in cortisol, even if they are transient, due to transient stressors, can actually break down um, the, the tight junction proteins that keep the cells of the gut close together and form the structure of that fine mesh strainer that we talked about before. Um, and, and so th this is how this works. When you look at some of the main influences on the integrity of the lining of the gut, and actually the list is a lot longer than this. So, so I'm going to give you this core thing and I'll, I'll just kind of enumerate the list before we close for today. When we have stressors, there tends to be a shift in the microbiome of the gut, basically the balance of good bacteria versus bad or potentially bad bacteria or microbes, uh, viruses, parasites, fungal species, etc. Let's use the word dysbiosis just to represent an imbalance between good microbes in your gut and bad microbes in the gut. So with stress, um, either acute significant stress or prolonged stress, we see a shift in the biotic environment to what we call dysbiosis, which tends to promote altered function. One of the things that happens is as our microbiome goes down, we lose the ability to ferment certain compounds from our diet to create what are called short-chain fatty acids, things like butyrate or propionate or, or acetate. And, and butyrate in particular is used in the process of repairing the tight junctions. And so we know that there's a link between not having dysbiosis or having a good healthy microbiome and having an intact gut barrier that has controlled permeability. And, and I think that's a, a very good way to state that and a good way to picture it. But when we have chronic stress, we lose our microbiome. We lose our ability to make these things called short chain fatty acids. And that tends to promote intestinal permeability because we can't repair the tissue. On top of that, stressors can also increase intestinal inflammation. And throw, so with stress chemistry comes gut inflammation. And in, in, anytime you inflame any tissue, you accelerate the rate of decay. And so if you're not compensating with an increase in the ability to repair, a stressor or chronic stressors can drive gut inflammation, which over time will also degrade that barrier system. And, you know, what's bad about this is that dysbiosis or an altered microbiome and intestinal inflammation can promote each other. So when we have stress and we lose our microbiome, we tend to promote more inflammation indirectly because part of the microbiome is to control inflammation. But stress will also directly drive intestinal inflammation. And both of those things work together to increase gut permeability or to cause a leaky gut. And in a cruel twist of design, when you increase intestinal permeability, you promote more dysbiosis, more intestinal inflammation, which presents a chemical stressor that drives more stress. And now we have stress, dysbiosis, gut inflammation, and intestinal permeability all working together as negative, uh, vicious cycles where one promotes the other and the problem just gets worse and worse and worse and worse over time. And so very clearly, Stress and, and cortisol or stress chemistry and cortisol plays a significant role in the health of the gut. And, and so how do we translate this into something practical, something that you might be able to take away? Well, one of the practical things is really to, to number one, not get sucked into all of the descriptors of conditions that leaky gut is involved in or symptoms that people with leaky gut have and make a just a judgment call that you do or do not have leaky gut. I have run hundreds, if not thousands, of leaky gut tests in the last decade or so. And I can tell you I am quite often surprised by the results. I might think that I understand someone's physiology by their history and maybe by other labs that I already have. And I go, oh, this person for sure has a leaky gut. And it comes back and they don't. And there are clients that I've worked with where I was convinced that they probably didn't have a leaky gut, but we checked just in case. And lo and behold, they did. And there's different degrees of leaky gut, different types of leaky gut, and so there's a whole spectrum here. The bottom line is this, is that if you really want to know if you have a leaky gut or not, don't base it on symptoms and don't even base it on 
an existing diagnosis. Just because you have Hashimoto's disease, for example, does not mean you have a leaky gut. Just because you have MS does not mean you have a leaky gut. Should you find out? Probably. What's the best way? Well, state-of-the-art testing these days is uh, blood testing based on identifying antibodies to the, the proteins involved in keeping that gut tissue together. So what happens when you have a breakdown in these tight junction proteins, uh, proteins spill into the blood, your immune system reacts to that, and we can measure those antibodies in blood. And, and if these antibodies are present, present above a certain level, we know that you have a leaky gut. We can tell which kind and we can gauge the severity. Um, you can't do that based on symptoms. You can't do it based on um, you know, just simply looking at pre-existing diagnoses of other conditions that you think might be associated with leaky gut. The other part of that then is, you know, if I, let's say that you have a leaky gut, does it make sense then that you should have an assessment of what your cortisol levels are? And, and I think the answer is yes to that, because what you don't want to do is ignore a potential complicating factor, because the bottom line is you're simply not going to fix a leaky gut by taking collagen, taking MSM, taking glutamine or licorice root or aloe vera or Jerusalem artichoke or whatever the supplement of the day is, because there's a lot of supplements out there that have been promoted as healing leaky gut. Leaky gut is a full-blown neuroendocrine immunological issue. And it, it almost always, almost always has multiple factors that promote it. And here I go down the, <laughs> the rabbit hole of talking about leaky gut more than talking about cortisol. But all right, let me just kind of stop myself here because I'm I'm starting to ramble just because I get involved in this. It's such a, a it's such a complex topic, and it's it's kind of one of the passions of mine. But nevertheless, you know, let's kind of end by saying this: if we understand the basics of what a leaky gut is, and the implications for local gut inflammation as well as systemic inflammation that can come from leaky gut, we need to understand number one: do we have it? Do we not? Really, the only way to tell that is by doing a test. And, and I'll just, not that I have any relationship with this company other than I use them as a clinician. Uh, Cyrex Labs, C-Y-R-E-X, Cyrex Labs um, has a blood test called Array Number 2. It runs about $195. It's not that expensive. It has to be ordered by a clinician. But for a couple hundred dollars, you can know for sure, do you have a leaky gut or do you not? And you don't have to just, you know, sit there and guess. Um, but if you if it does turn out that you have leaky gut, I think you're kind of obligated to assess your adrenal system anyways, because if you have very low cortisol and you have no circadian rhythm to speak of, what we might call a flatliner, then you're not going to be able to repair your leaky gut. And you can drink all the bone broth and take all the collagen that you want. You're probably not going to repair that gut just simply because your cortisol deficiency won't let you. And on the other side, if your cortisol levels are too high all the time and you're subjected to ongoing stressors, whether those are internal stressors or external stressors, again, you can drink all the, all the bone broth and take collagen and take L-glutamine as much as you want. You can double, triple your doses and you're still not going to fix it because you're not dealing with the underlying metabolic abnormalities that are really promoting it and may have been involved in the initiation at the very beginning anyways. And so, you know, even though that this is really <laughs> supposed to be about cortisol, it ended up being more about leaky gut, but, you know, cortisol and stress chemistry has a, a very important role. In fact, there are um, multiple studies, both in humans as well as animals, that look at psychological stressors and, and changes in, or what we call transient permeability. For example, we have, we have studies that look at people who have a fear of public speaking and they, they do metrics and, and kind of assess their gastric permeability before they go out and do a public speaking event. Then they go out and they do the public speaking event and then they remeasure all those same tests and we can actually measure changes in permeability as a result of that single stressor. And imagine if you're locked into an environment or a life or a lifestyle where your stress is constant and it's unremitting, chances are you're gonna have a lot more than just a transient change in your leaky gut. It might be of interest to note that um, even something as simple as consuming gluten 
can cause transient changes in gut permeability, not necessarily because gluten damages the gut, but there are um, receptors called zonulin receptors in, in the cellular architecture, the part that kind of keeps the cells together to keep the filter working, if you will. There are receptors that get activated by gluten proteins so that when pretty much everybody who eats gluten, those, those receptors turn on and proteins kind of open up and create a space for things to get past the barrier. It's almost like, you know, having somebody hold the door open for you at the movie theater so you can slip in even though you didn't pay for a ticket. That's kind of like the, a, a mental image of, of how this works. And so, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, there's all kinds of stressors and even dietary things that we do that cause these transient states of permeability, which is why it's probably better to think of you know, it's not that with a healthy gut there's zero permeability because then we wouldn't be able to absorb our nutrients. So we always have some degree of permeability. It's just that at one moment or another, or as a change in our ongoing state, we can have an increased permeability that then tends to drive local as well as systemic inflammation. And cortisol plays a key role in regulating how that system works. Now, it's not only cortisol. I'm just going to give you a short list and then we'll leave it to a different series to talk about leaky gut in a lot more detail. But, you know, standard American diet, pro-inflammatory foods, nightshades, lectin-containing foods, all have been shown to, in some people, increase the potential for leaky gut. We see it with any type of gut infection. H. pylori is perhaps the most well-studied one, but any infection in the gut that increases intestinal inflammation or decreases your microbiome can cause the same problem. We see it with um, steroids and, and other drugs, immunosuppressants. Um, we see it with head injury. In fact, we have, uh, and this is studied almost exclusively, I believe, in the animal model. Um, believe it or not, leaky gut, the first signs of leaky gut can show up within hours of someone sustaining a concussion. And it doesn't even have to be a bad one because these are chemical reactions that are unrelated to the magnitude of the impact with the head. Uh, we can also see it in, in kids with neurodevelopmental disorders. We can see it in aging people who have dementia and cognitive decline associated with neurodegeneration. Um, we also see it with anything that increases systemic inflammation. Probably the most well studied is uh, the inflammatory cascade associated with high blood sugar, high insulin. So we're talking about prediabetes, diabetes, and, and metabolic syndrome. And then finally, we have multiple studies that show, and they, we don't have a single study that shows all of these things. I'm just going to name several things that are that come out of multiple studies. But basically, when they do biopsy, uh, tissue biopsy studies of, of gut barrier problems, uh, we see low testosterone, low estrogen, low progesterone, and low thyroid. And so whether we're talking about diet, gut infections, changes in the microbiome, systemic or local inflammation, function and integrity of the brain and how that regulates the gut environment, or general hormone balance, cortisol is only one of at least a dozen or so different factors that can create and perpetuate a leaky gut, which is why I was saying earlier, in most cases, you're not going to fix leaky gut by only taking a leaky gut supplement. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't do that because at the very least, you're kind of hedging your bets. But if you change nothing else in your life, if you think or you know you have a leaky gut and you change nothing else and all you do is go on a, a bone broth, broth fast for three days or a week or you start taking something with L-glutamine in it or whatever the case might be, you're not going to fix a leaky gut by doing that because it's a bigger problem. It's a bigger problem. All right, I've gone way too long and I got way off track today. So my apologies, but hopefully there was some information and some nuggets in them for you. Thanks for listening and stay tuned. We'll be back with another episode of the Inflammation Nation. Thank you so much for listening to the Inflammation Nation. If you found this episode valuable, please rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast. Be the first to know when a new episode drops so that you can stay on top of your game. It also helps others like you find the answers they need. And why not head over to my main website, drnoseworthy.com, that's drnoseworthy.com, to explore my personalized functional medicine coaching programs, submit a question to the podcast, maybe take a quiz, 
or even reach out to me using the contact form that you can find there. We'll see you next time.